Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. In today's video, we are going to be discussing Unit 2, Lesson 3, all about neurotransmitters and what effect they have on behavior. So let's get started. To begin with, we need to know how neurotransmitters fit into biology. So these fit into biology through the nervous system, which is composed of individual cells called neurons. And here we can see the different, different um, components of each neuron and the conjunction between two neurons, which is called a synapse. So the nervous system of our body uses two different types of communication, electrical and chemical. So to begin with, the electrical communication basically involves excitation by um, nerve cells. So every neuron has a certain threshold of excitation, which is a level to where um, the cumulative excitation reaches to then um, engage a signal. If there's enough signal to cross the threshold, then the neuron will fire. So this action potential is the result which continues a signal further throughout the neuron. And this signal is very important to know that it's all or none, which um, we can identify using a gun analogy. Shoot, if you press it slowly, it's still going to shoot. If you press it fast, it's still going to shoot. So once um, a neuron has its threshold crossed, it's going to fire. The firing will not change depending on how the conditions are. If the threshold is crossed, it's going to fire the same way. And now for the chemical processes that occur. So we have the synapse as shown before, which is the end of the axon and the beginning of a dendrite which is seen here. So the synapse is that conjunction between two neurons. So from the dendrites and the soma throughout the axon until the um, synapse here is going to be all electrical. As we said before, the action potential that travels through from the sending cell and the receiving cell will be on the other side of the synapse. And this little conjunction here will um, involve the chemical response. So let's look at that now. So once the message reaches the end of the axon of the sending cell and reaches that synapse, we're going to convert the message from electrical to chemical. So in this synapse, there's going to be vesicles containing neurotransmitters. These vesicles will be um, will be bonded to the cell membrane of the end of the sending cell, and then will be released into the synaptic cleft, which is the gap in the synapse. And from the synaptic cleft, it will go on to bind to the other, um, bind to the other cell membrane of the receiving cell so that it can continue the action potential and become electrical again so that that neuron can now have an action potential, which will be transferred to another um, neuron through a chemical message. So the neurotransmitters basically are the chemical messengers that travel on, that continue on the action potential um, when they are um, binded to the other neuron cell membrane. And this can either be absorbed by the other cell membrane or metabolized if it's not absorbed or taken back through reuptake, which is basically the sending cell just taking back any excess neurotransmitter. Um, and once bound, the action potential is just going to keep on going, like, like I said before. Um, the chemical message from the dendrites to the soma through the axon all the way to the axon terminal to the synapse will be um, um, electrical. And then once it reaches the synapse, it's going to turn chemical with the neurotransmitters, which are going to convey the information from the axon terminal, which is this part, to the um, dendrites, which is this part. So this little gap here is where things turn chemical. And then once the 
neurotransmitter is absorbed, the um, can, the react the potential will now be electrical again and pass through, entering chemical again. So that's basically the process of chemical transmission and how the electrical and chemical transmission will will be transmitted. Let's quickly review the process of neurotransmission. So here we have the sending cell in blue and we have the receiving cell in purple and there are the vesicles with the neurotransmitters inside. Now the electrical action potential is going to travel down the sending cell and cause the vesicles to bind to the cell membrane and to be released into the synaptic cleft here. And these neurotransmitters will, some of them will be absorbed by the receiving cell to then transfer the action potential. And some of them will be taken back through reuptake or uh, metabolized. And again, this whole thing is called a synapse, but the gap here is called the synaptic gap or cleft. And that is basically a quick review of the process of neurotransmission. Hopefully that made sense. Moving on, there are different types of neurotransmitters we need to know about. There are excitatory neurotransmitters and there are inhibitory neurotransmitters. So excitatory, as the name suggests, will exciting or stimulating to the body or to the reaction. And inhibitory neurotransmitters will be inhibiting or stopping the impulse from traveling, will be calming. So basically, um, the excitatory neurotransmitters will allow the impulse to cross the synapse to the other neuron, while the inhibitory neurotransmitter will not allow the action potential to travel further, it will prevent the action potential from crossing the synapse onto the other neuron, onto the other neuron. And we also have things that affect neurotransmitters called agonists and antagonists. These are other chemicals that react with neurotransmitters to either enhance or counteract their activity. So agonists are basically chemicals that are going to promote the activity of neurotransmitter. While antagonists, as we can relate to literature, are chemicals that counteract the neurotransmitters. They will prevent the signal from being passed further. And these can all be applied to an actual drug type, which is called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are um, abbreviated as SSRIs. This is, um, Prozac is an example of this, which treats depression. So these selectively block the reuptake. What was reuptake? Reuptake was the um, taking in of excess neurotransmitter by the sending cell. So they're going to block the reuptake to let um, there be more neurotransmitter in the synapse. So the effects of serotonin are enhanced. And we're gonna be looking at the actual function of serotonin and further on in the presentation. But serotonin basically reg regulates just mood, sleep, um, things like that. And this is used to treat depression because if you block the reuptake of serotonin, you're gonna have enhanced effects of serotonin, which will help alleviate mood. Okay, so now let's get into more specific effects of serotonin. So as we said before, serotonin is involved in factors like sleep and mood, and it is in fact inhibitory. In the study Crockett et al. conducted in 2010, this investigated um, the effect of serotonin on pro-social behavior. So basically, participants were given a moral dilemma where they had to decide whether they can experience an utilitarian outcome or an aversive harmful outcome. One was really personal involving a person actually pushing off someone from a cliff to hit a track which will prevent five other people from getting run over by a train or they can um, pull a lever which is impersonal to just divert the train to hurt less people. So there's personal and impersonal. Personal is actually pushing someone off to prevent further harm and impersonal is using that like indirect mode, the switching of the lever. You can see an image of this on page 68 of your um, textbook. So they basically use this moral dilemma and SSRIs in the test group with one placebo group to test their, the effect of serotonin. So the results show that the group with the SSRI, the one with the increased effect of serotonin, made participants less likely to choose a situation where they had to personally hurt someone. So the personal situation was the, the only situation that was affected was a personal situation because 
people with more serotonin engaged in more pro-social behavior, which means that they were they wanted to be more um, socially acceptable and socially, I guess, um, caring. So the personal situation where someone actually had to push someone off a cliff and kill them to prevent the deaths of five other people. So this situation was actually affected by the drug, but not the impersonal. So the people who um, took this drug were less likely to um, push a man off a bridge or a cliff because they were more pro-social as a result of the serotonin. Now let's look into the effect of dopamine on romantic love. So Fisher, Aaron, and Brown, conducted in 2005, studied the biological process of romantic love. To begin with, um, we want to know what dopamine is. So this is basically an excitatory neurotransmitter that is involved in motivation, emotion, and pleasure. So this is basically the neurotransmitter that is released when you bite into that chocolate bar. And this is also often involved in addiction because in drugs, um, people over rely on these for the euphoria and pleasure that it gives them. And this is basically activating the dopaminergic pathway, which is involved in pleasure, motivation, and emotion. So the study basically found that when a image of a person's loved one was displayed while the person was actually inside an fMRI, which we will discuss in the next lesson, the brain activated dopamine rich areas which is basically the ventral tegmental area and the cardiac nucleus so when someone looked at someone they loved it um, promoted romantic love within them and this basically activated pertinent brain areas um, which is part of the dop dopaminergic pathway so this shows how dopamine plays a role in romantic love now let's look into the role of dopamine in Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is basically the lack of dopamine, like a reduction in dopamine, which causes this. Um, Frida L. conducted in 2001, studied the role of dopamine in Parkinson's disease. They found that some patients who received a transplant of dopamine producing cells into their putamen, which is a structure in the limbic system involved in movement regulation, um, they actually experienced a reduction in the symptoms of the Parkinson's disease. The lack of dopamine causes um, things like shaking, rigidity, difficulty with movement and walking. So people who received a transplant of dopamine producing cells um, had those symptoms alleviated. They were able to move better. However, we have to note that um, the effects were not as strong for those over 60 years of age, and the effects were more pronounced for those under 60 years of age, because as we now know, neuroplasticity declines with age. So those older had a less likely to um, be able to change their brain structure, less likely to be able to undergo neuroplasticity. Um, they had a lower neuroplasticity. So they were not able to incorporate these new dopamine producing cells into their brain. However, those under six years of age with higher rates of neuroplasticity were able to effectively incorporate these as they were able to change their neurons as discussed previous lesson. Lastly, let's look at the role of serotonin depression as we discussed when we were looking at SSRIs. So serotonin has actually been associated with major depressive disorder. The serotonin hypothesis states that if we have low levels of serotonin, we're going to have the development of depression because we know that serotonin is involved in mood regulation and less of that will be detrimental to mood. And depression has also been linked to a specific gene. When um, Caspi et al. studied the susceptibility of getting depression in response to very stressful life events. So, um, that's it for the lesson on neurotransmitters. Thank you guys so much. And um, please make sure to tune in for our next video on brain imaging techniques. Thank you all.